John pioneered aerial mustering and uh, amassed a huge number of hours. I think one of the things that stood out in uh, the memories of those that listened to him was the time that he got a willy willy in a moonie and was inverted at about three, 30 or 40 feet. And it was only his skill as an aerobatic pilot that got him out of that. But um, I can also recall the time that John was inverted in a tiger moth and the stick fell out and he called on Jesus Christ for help. But that's another story. <laughs> John, I know and uh, that uh, sheep tend to work up into the wind. So if it's an easterly, you, you go and look on the east side paddock. I'm wondering if cattle are the same. No, uh, uh, cattle are quite different. Um, there's cattle and cattle. There's cattle down the southwest, and the paddocks are now domesticated and one thing another. Uh, there's cattle up in the like, Gascoigne area, and they're in quiet because they've been handled more often, but they're still pastoral cattle and they live for the aircraft. And up the Kimberleys, at the small open range, uh, no fences. Of course, most stations have a bullet paddock to put the, the bullets in for sale. Um, and then uh, it's... Um, the only part the wind comes into it is when I've mobbed up the, uh, the cattle and ready to run them into what we call the coacher mob. Uh, the coacher mob are uh, more handled cattle which have already been pre-mustered and held by the, the ground plant, and the plant being the, the men on the horses or the, the land rovers or whatever. And uh, it's important to have them positioned downwind from the cattle I'm running in, so that the smell from, uh, from the um, horses and whatever uh, doesn't disturb the cattle which I'm running in and otherwise they can go anywhere. Also, uh, it's very important for the men on the horses to lay down and uh, sort of hide, hide the sky themselves as best they can because uh, the cattle, once they spot anybody, particularly on foot, uh, if they're on on foot, um, will just, just go, fly off. And once they're gone, it's almost impossible to get them back to the, the place where they ran from. But that doesn't mean to say we lose them because I, follow, I used to follow them up and then pull them up somewhere else and then move the coach mob around further on later in the day. Um, so that that was uh, the car. I was at Navy down for one occasion and I did a muster in the exact area on where Peter Van Emmerich uh, uh, come to his tragedy. And there's a little range there nearby which is named uh, Van Emmerich Range. Um, I haven't got them any aviation map that it did at that time. I don't know whether they still have it there. But there was a little range there. And during the course of the muster, it took me, oh, most of the morning from first flight till about 10 o'clock, I suppose. And I must have been up about 500 head of old scrub of bullocks and bulls there, wild cattle, you know, stuff that had been mustered much before. And got them into a, or into a big thicket where I camped them up to then go back, refuel, and then come back and then I position the coach and mob to run, the, uh, run them into the main mob. And uh, during the course of getting there, just about when I was nearly finished, uh, I saw all this dust coming along and uh, it was a grader grading a road. And I dived on him, tried to stop him because he was going to uh, affect uh, my muster and the cattle which was moving into the thicket. But he put, took no notice and he kept going and he went straight through my cattle, split them up, and he kept going. Uh, so I Look at him, saw a little bit of course, and uh, I watched him go through a little gap in another range, and just through the gap there was a miners' uh, camp. Uh, several, actually it was a Frenchman, um, had, had uh, prospecting for diamonds at the place. They were out of course on, the, on doing the prospecting, but at the camp was a station cook and of course a grader, and several of their tents and their trestles they put their, their samples on and one thing and another. So it then took me another couple of hours to round up the cattle which had all dispersed, put them back into the thicket, and then uh, settle them down. To settle them down, you just circle the thicket, watch for anything that's moving, push them back in, and then uh, they'll fly up, lay down or do whatever. And just a little point on that, that these cattle, they're made up of various mobs of cattle, uh, might be 20 or 30 in a little mob, and there's always a leader, quite often a female. And when you run them in together, they don't like to stay together for too long. 
after an hour or two, they seemed to get a bit upset with each other. The, uh, the young, uh, what we call Mickey Bulls, they're about three year old stuff, something like that, and they're finding a lot of girlfriends, so they're interested in other things. And, uh, uh, but then, if the leader or a mob goes out, almost to the exact beast will follow that leader along and go with them. Maybe the little Mickey Bulls might not have that same idea or inclination. Um, so it's very important to get back before this happens. So I have to go refuel, get back, fly around, then position the uh, coach and mob somewhere where they're downwind of these cut and then I start them off and then uh, preferably slowly, we don't want them galloping, uh, they get hot and, uh, and uncontrollable and bad enough as they are. Uh, if possible, you try and take a small mob in at a time, but sometimes you can't, you've got to take a lot. But on this occasion, I was pretty mad at this greater driver and I positioned the, uh, the coach and mob at the end of the range and there's two places and ways I could take the cattle either down the left hand side of the range or through the gap and down the other side. Well, I was pretty mad, so you can guess what I did. I ran them through the gap, through the camp, flattened all the tents. The grader driver was up the top of the grader going like this, and the cook was up a tree, and I was laughing like mad. And I had a hell of a good time. The, the, the cattle, um, of course, they got a little bit hot, and we didn't get them all. We got most of them, I suppose 50% of them a little bit better, uh, but we wouldn't have done much better in any case because there's, there's about 500 in the mob. So that, that is uh, a little bit I want to say about Napier Downs. John, did you use a siren? Uh, no, I never had a siren. I did try one early stage, but it doesn't mean anything. I mainly used a, a, a horn, motor horn or something like that, but they didn't do, really do much. It was all for your own frustration. It's something to do with your fingers when you're getting a bit mad, which often happened and just blow the horn off. Uh, no, um, it was mainly a mustering, uh, I should say at this stage, when you, you go out and you locate your, your mob of cattle, um, they'll be feeding out. So the first pass, you come in first pass with your wing at the direction you want to take them. So that'll be 90 degrees to where you're flying. The first pass, normally the cattle will tend to run together and mob up. The cows will run to their mother and uh, they get like that. The second pass you come down and it might start them off in their direction. Once you've got them going off, you, you do look for cattle pads or something like that. You can put them on the pad, then you back off. You get up as high as you, you, you can, uh, probably about 200, 250 feet, and um, then you stay there behind them. It's a case of sight and sound. Um, if you fly, if you want to turn them a bit to the left, you fly over to the right, up high, and gradually they'll tend to there. If they don't, well then you do a pass down lower uh, and turn them. Uh, if they're on a cattle pad, and then quite often the country up in the Kimberleys, it's black soil, which is like, it's a very crazed, deep little gutters and things like that, and which are difficult for the cattle to run over. But they do have their pads, so you, you put them onto, uh, onto a pad, so then you back off, let them follow the leader along the pad, look for another pad that goes the other way you want to go, and at the exact, exact right time you've got to time your, turn, your run so that you can turn the leader up the next pad. Then you back off and then they'll follow it. And you can do this zigzagging through the, the black soil country until you can get them out into a thicket or, or if possible into the coaching mob. So that's um, the, the, the basis of it, so the sight and sound um, turn to the right, go to the left, turn to the left, turn to the right, stay up behind and don't push them too hard. The, the cattle can only move as fast as the smallest calf will travel. Sometimes you have to cut the, them off if they're too young to keep up with the mob. Um, on a muster in the Kimberley, so the yards are normally about 10 miles apart, um, or, sorry about every 5 miles apart for the old times, but with the aircraft um, you use 10 miles and then you start off about three or four miles before a, a yard do your muster and finish off and then go three or four miles the other side and bring anything back we go out 10 miles either side of a straight line between the yards depending on the nature of the country whether it's ranges and 
all that kind of thing. Um, preferably run small mobs into the coaches as they move, moved along, otherwise it's necessary to put them into a thicket of some sort and camp, camp them up like I just described. Uh, so that's uh, basically the, the um, why we do cattle mustering. When you get into range country and the uh, Dolomite and the oh, very steep, and the old bullocks all go right over the top, but generally we try and get them to go down the bottom and through, uh, around on tableland country. Normally there's a river or creek at the bottom of the tablelands, particularly at Tayland Station, where I used to do a little block of and mustering, and you'd have a very strong easterly wind. And on the west side was where uh, most of the mustering was done, and went, uh, between uh, Tableland and Mornington Station. Um, there's severe downdrafts off the tablelands, and the cattle used to be down below. So somehow or other, I'd have to get in there and get in between the end of the downdraft and, and the, and the tablelands. Uh, invariably, that meant doing stall turns, coming right up to the face of the, the uh, tableland or the breakaway, and do a stall turn and come back down the other side to keep behind the cattle, and without getting into the turbulence of the downdraft. And then get the, the, the cattle moving along uh, the river in the, in the direction you want them to go. Um, they do go for cover uh, and they, they like trees because trees is, is an obstruction. So if you're trying to push them too hard, they're going to pull up. So you've got to let them just travel at their own pace. And then and during the course of the day, they've taken advantage of some break where you can get them out and then uh, out in the open and hand them over to the, the cake. You must have camels or goats? Uh, well, with goats, I did an awful lot of practice on goats. And, and uh, before I did my first sheep master and cattle master, I used to practice on the goats up around the Merchiston River and uh, got valuable experience from that. And well, I did an awful lot of, of uh, goat mustering. Again, more so, you, you're up higher. Uh, when you start them off, if you get down low, they'll just jump in the trees and climb. Uh, climb up trees. Um, camels, they spit at you. <laughs> they don't do anything. You go past them and they do. They really, they spit at you. Um, donkeys are the worst. Um, you'd be doing your cattle muster and then you'd see a mob of donkeys and they come in and split up because cattle and, and uh, horses and donkeys, they don't go together and that split your mob up. Um, and well, they're real asses. <laughs> Uh, very difficult to do anything with, um, but the, there was an awful lot of Kimberley in my time, but I, I think they've shot most of them out now, at least um, uh, they were do I started doing a program on that with helicopters and, and you know, at the time I left up there. But, uh, but camels, no. Well, thanks very much, John. I think we all have really uh, been interested in what you've got to say. Uh, a lot of ours, he did something like 28,000, 28, I think.